welcome everyone to today's program. Um, you get to learn about trains today. So it's going to be really cool. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. His name is Dennis Hogan. And yes, he's, he's uh, from the Midland area, I think you said? Frisco. Frisco. Frisco now, but you were... Uh, oh, oh, originally from Midland, Texas. Mid that's it, yes. And um, he's going to be talking about the Texas Midland, um, which was very innovative for its time um, uh, when it was put in. And he is, uh, Dennis is a retired uh, high school science teacher who currently lives in Frisco, and he just loves railroad history. And so do you like to visit the different ones? Oh, and yes, go and, I definitely. Yeah. And I also want to thank this month's uh, sponsors for this month, which is Gene Adams. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dennis. Yeah. Don't forget to turn on your mic. It should be on. It is. All right. Thank you very much. I, it's not on. It's not on. Okay. Are <laughs> lights on? Does this does that work as, as well? This mm -hmm. mic? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, well, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Uh, I was telling Susan, this is the uh, second time I've been here in the past year. <clears throat> I was here in, in last August when uh, I think it was the uh, World War II Roundtable Group had one of their uh, first meetings. So it gave me an opportunity to see the museum, and, uh, and today is another opportunity. <clears throat> so uh, um, before I get started, I want to verify with Susan. Is this program about the Texas Mill and Railroad, or am I presenting about how to declutter your husband's uh, hobby room? <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. Maybe a little bit of both, okay. All right, well, I think it's the Texas Mill. So the first image up here uh, is a uh, what is known as a railroad pass, so a copy of a pass. These were issued by railroads to uh, uh, officials and other railroads, other than their own, uh, to VIPs, shippers, and, and so oftentimes to politicians. So this is uh, an example of one from 1897. If you'll notice here, whose signature do you think that is? Any guesses? Can you read it? No. I don't think I could read it unless I knew it already ahead of time. Oh, is it? That's E H R Green. And that's Colonel Green. Colonel Green, yeah, that's his signature. Ned Green. And that's who Ned Green, Green was named after, right? That's no. right, yeah. <laughs> no. No. Oh, I don't know if it's. If, I don't think it was named. No. The no. Green was named after Ed, uh, Ned Green. No. I don't think so, no. He's a Yankee. Seen it towards the. Yeah. To the. Uh huh. Right. So what's my interest in the Texas Millennium Railroad? <clears throat> really twofold. Uh, to me it's a fascinating railroad. I call it a hot rod railroad because in its day it was very innovative, uh, uh, state-of-the-art railroad. And so uh, it makes makes it more interesting to me than some of the other, other railroads that were in existence. The other reason uh, I enjoy uh, researching this railroad is both sides of my family, uh, there were farmers in, in uh, Kaufman County starting in the 1880s. <clears throat> and no doubt they would have had, uh, been very familiar with uh, Texas Midland Railroad. <coughs> in fact, I know for a fact that my paternal great-grandfather who uh, settled on a farm near College Mountain, you know where that is in Kaufman County. He, um, he, his name appears on a roster of Confederate veterans 
we're taking a special Texas Midland train to one of the reunions or conventions. So I know for a fact that he rode, the, rode that railroad. All right, oddly enough, the name Texas Midland didn't originate with the Texas Midland that we're familiar with around here. It was actually first used by the Gulf Colorado and Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, they used that, uh, that nickname for about a decade or so in the uh, 1880s. And then after that time, they, they dropped the name and, and just uh, <clears throat> didn't use it at all. The railroad that we now are familiar with as the Texas Midland had its origins in the um, railroad called the Houston and Texas Central. Houston and Texas Central, let's see if this. Okay. Started out in 1857 here in Houston and built up toward the Red River over a number of years. Uh, <clears throat> finally reached the Red River in 1873. Okay. And so that is the kind of the uh, birthplace of what we're going to be looking at today. Now you notice here a little town called Garrett, which is just north of Ennis. They uh, incorporated, separately incorporated uh, a railroad, uh, actually a branch line called the Northeast Extension. Okay, of the Houston and Texas Central. Uh, actually, it went by the name Texas Central, but it was really spawned off of the Houston and Texas Central. There was also a, um, another branch here called the Northwestern Extension that <clears throat> branched off from Bremont, went through Waco up to Albany. All right, that was the uh, Northwest Extension, or Northwest Branch. So our focus is going to be on the uh, Northeast French, which uh, ran from Garrett to Roberts. Oops. Okay. Now, a lot of people ask, where was Roberts? And for a long time, I had no clue. <laughs> I just knew that it was, it was north of, uh, of Garrett. All right. So as it turns out, Roberts, after a little research, here's Quinlan, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Okay. Roberts was a community right here, just south of Quinlan. And apparently he must have dis disappeared over time, especially when Quinlan start started to grow. All right, so that's as far as the northeast extension of the Texas Central belt to until about uh, until the 1890s. Ah, all right. This is going to be a story about a lot of uh, interesting people and places and things. So, uh, enter Henrietta Hedda Robinson, okay? Otherwise known as Hedda, Hedda Green, okay? She was at one time known as the richest woman in America uh, during the Gilded Age. Uh, talking about the you know, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, Admirers would call her the Queen of Wall Street, or detractors would call her the Witch of Wall Street. <laughs> you take your pick. She, uh, she was born into a very rich William family in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, had a Quaker upbringing, which may explain uh, a lot about her fiscal conservatism. Anyway, she, uh, she married uh, a gentleman, a millionaire in his own right, Edward Henry Green. So, Henry Green, that's where the, the uh, name that she was more familiarly called. Okay. By the way, this uh, dog right here, uh, any of you ever watched the uh, Masterpiece Theater series called uh, All Things Great and Small? All Creatures. All Creatures Great and Small, thank you. Well, there's a, a character who's kind of like Hetty Green, who has a Pickney's called uh, Tricky. Tricky Woo. Okay, and that that dog right there reminds me of Tricky Woo. All 
All right, so once uh, Hetty Green uh, made her fortune uh, on Wall Street and so forth, uh, the railroads and banks, um, she became rivals with somebody known as C.P. Huntington, who was the president of the Southern Pacific Railroad. You might remember from history that uh, when the first transcontinental railroad was being built, you had the Central Pacific on the West Coast and the Union Pacific starting from Omaha and Council Bluffs. Okay. Well, C.P. Huntington was, what is, was one of the, what was called the Big Four, the four principal movers and shakers of the Central Pacific Railroad. And later on, he became president of the Southern Pacific, which was a, a combination of the Central Pacific and the, the Southern Pacific. Anyway, he, uh, he and Hetty Green just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. She, uh, they butted heads over quite a, uh, over uh, railroads and uh, how they were being uh, operated. And uh, she was quite uh, uh, upset about the way Huntington uh, treated the Houston and Texas Central Railroad, basically through neglect let her uh, slide into receivership. <laughs> she was a, a principal bondholder and uh, stockholder of the Houston and Texas Central. Anyway, uh, in the 1880s, it went, the, the uh, HNTC, along with the two branches, uh, went into receivership. Ed, Hetty uh, bought the Northeast branch, which is the branch that became the Texas Midland. And she uh, battled to acquire the Northwest branch but eventually lost out to Huntington. So that kind of aggra more, one more thing to be aggravated about uh, with regard to uh, C.P. Huntington. All right, there's a lot that can be said about Hetty Green if you're interested sometime. There are three uh, good reference books that I uh, displayed the covers of up here. The one in the middle, the, the day they shook the plum tree, probably was the first really good uh, biography to come out. It came out in 1963. Um, the other two books are more recent. You can probably find those on Amazon. But anyway, if you have an interest in uh, reading about her life, uh, these are three good references. Oops. Okay. This is kind of a collage to tell a story here, okay? So, Colonel Edward Howland Robinson, AKA Ned Green, okay, he's our, he's our man of focus for the rest of this presentation. Here is a uh, photo of him, he's a gentleman right here, sitting on the steps of a, a passenger car. A uh, rather tall gentleman, uh, probably weighed somewhere between 250 to 300 pounds, had a cork leg, uh, he injured his leg when he was a child. His mother, being a rather miserly person, uh, didn't get it taken care of, and he ended up having it amputated. So for the rest of his life, he had a cork leg. But that didn't uh, that didn't slow him down in terms of uh, his business talents. Okay, I'm gonna go clockwise here. This photo right here, here's uh, Ned Green, you can kind of get an idea how tall he is. And right next to him is Maybelle Harlow, okay, who was a prostitute that he met in Chicago when he was there on a business assignment. And once he came to Texas, he brought her down, and he was basically, she was basically his living girlfriend for the remainder of his, uh, his uh, stay in Texas. And he, Later on in life, he married her, but uh, Hetty didn't uh, approve of that relationship, so they didn't get married until after she died. Down here, uh, one of the things that uh, Colonel Green is noted for was introducing the first, or one of the first, automobiles into the state of Texas. Um, this was delivered from the St. Louis Car Company by rail to Dallas, and then uh, Associate his, who's in the driver's seat there, uh, delivered it to him terrible. Okay, so that's not Ned Green there in the, uh, in the car. All right, what's the postage stamp doing here? <laughs> the upside down. 
Yeah. Uh, Ned Green was had many hobbies and uh, interests, one of which was stamp collecting. And uh, this is a famous stamp if you're a philatelist, uh, uh, called the uh, inverted Jenny stamp. Okay. Uh, Jenny there is, is the type of aircraft, it was a training type aircraft that was developed by the United States during World War I. It was never used in combat, but it was used as a train. Anyway, the post, post office department printed a whole sheet of these with the plane upside down. And so, once that was discovered, it became an instant collector item. Okay, and uh, it turns out that Ned Green, when he found out about it, bought the entire sheet of converted Jenny stamps. <laughs> And he uh, kept most of them parceled some out to friends and so forth. If you go to the Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. today, which is right across the street from Union Station, they have a Postal Museum there. Well, this stamp, or a sheet of that stamp, is on display. It was also a uh, radio a uh, hobbyist. He set up his own radio station and uh, operated it. I think uh, the station later became WMAF. That, that would be in Massachusetts, not here in Texas. And then the uh, final thing up here, this is something I just recently learned about. He uh, founded what was known as the Tarpon Club down off uh, St. Joseph Island near, near uh, Rajas Pass. Okay, it was an exclusive club of for sportsmen. Okay, had a very exclusive clientele of railroad officials, politicians, and uh, and businessmen. Um, and so he operated that for a few years, uh, and then it, it uh, closed down. I think in the early 1900s. It didn't last too long. Now this is not to be confused with the Tarpon Inn. There's a and another place that still exists down there uh, called the Tarpon Inn, which is quite famous as well. But this was uh, di a different uh, uh, hotel. Okay, so uh, I said earlier that uh, Hetty Green had purchased the Northeast branch or division of the Houston and Texas Central, or, or Texas Central, in 1892. And so uh, she sent her son, Ned, to uh, Terrell, Texas in 1893. Basically, this was his, uh, his uh, uh, he was put on trial by her to see what he could do in the business world. Okay. He, had, he had done some work in, in, in banking and, and so forth, and, and a little bit in railroad business. But uh, this was going to be his first real uh, uh, chance to see how he could manage a railroad. So he came down here in 1893. I think the uh, story goes he walked into a Terrell Bank with a uh, cashier's check of a half million dollars. They were just completely blown away by that. Had to verify really who he was. But once they realized who he was, they glad they took his money. Um, so uh, he became, he lived in Terrell for quite a while. Uh, eventually he moved to Dallas. Uh, the social climate in, in, in Terrell, especially with his girlfriend, uh, wasn't too welcoming, so he, he moved some of it. He moved his uh, uh, his uh, headquarters to, to Dallas. All right. So what did he do once he took over the railroad? Well, he he, uh, he uh, brought in heavy rail, got some new locomotives, uh, better ballast, and uh, improved basically the infrastructure of the railroad. Is what his uh, first measures were, and he also extended the line to Paris. From Roberts. Roberts was kind of like a station in the middle of nowhere. It just there was nothing going on at Roberts to to warrant being the terminus of the railroad. There's a quote here that kind of kind of summarizes his uh, his uh, philosophy on taking over this railroad. He wanted the best uh, in his uh, in his business. And uh, expected that would pay off eventually to, if he uh, if he produced a, a quality uh, running railroad. Okay, a little bit of.
knowledge you hear on the construction of the railroad. So, as I said, it started out as, uh, as this kind of semi-independent railroad, part of the Houston and Texas Central, simply known as the Texas Central Northeast Extension. So, 1882, it built from here to Terrell, and then in 1884, it went from Terrell to Roberts. Okay. And, and those two construction uh, dates are before Ned uh, Green came into the picture. All right. So once he got into the picture in 1893, started to expand the railroad and extended Roberts to Greenville, 1895, under the new charter of the Texas, or new, new name, Texas Midland. 1896-97, uh, Greenville to Paris. They, uh, since uh, the Cotton Belt, that's the St. Louis Southwestern, already had track from Greenville to Commerce, they just got tractor trucks over it. Okay, it saves them a little bit of money, at least in construction. And then 1898, uh, Midland Junction to Ennis. Okay, so they, that, that little section of the railroad there was intended to bring the railroad directly into Ennis. And I'll show you the map here in just a minute. In 1923, they finally got around to uh, building their own railroad between Commerce and Greenville. Rather than, rather than relying on tractor rights over their cotton belt. So, so now they had a completely on the railroad all the way from Ennis to uh, Paris. Okay. Entirely Texas Midland owned and operated. All right, so at its, at its peak, Texas Midland covered 125 miles. All right, this is what I want to show you here, a little map. All right, so this is coming in from uh, Kaufman here. Originally, the line went to Garrett, okay? And then when I say 1898, it built from Midland Junction, which is here, directly into Ennis. Okay, so this little section here basically became a branch line. Okay, it was no longer really, probably not used that much. Okay, since they could uh, directly access Ennis. More detailed map of, uh, of railroads east of Dallas. Here's Greenville. Okay, Paris is up here. Ennis is, where's Coffin? Ennis is down here. Okay. So Texas Moon went all the way up, up there. Okay. Uh, Greenville was, was quite a hub of railroads uh, in its own right. You had, you had the Texas Midland. You also had the uh, Missouri, Kansas, Texas, also known as the Katy, and Katy had like five different five different directions you could go out of Greenville on the Katy Railroad. You could go uh, north to uh, Denison. You could go south or southwest to Ennis, excuse me, to Dallas. You could go east to Jefferson and eventually to Shreveport. You could go west to Farmersville and McKinney. And then uh, the last segment of the Katy Railroad out of Greenville was uh, southeast of here to Minneola. If you ever drive that highway, I think it's 69, isn't it? Yeah. Down to Emory, that, that, that uh, branch line paralleled basically Highway 69. Or I should say Highway 69 paralleled the, the railroad since it was there first. <coughs> Now, interestingly enough, there must have been plans at one time by the Texas Midland to go all, to extend its uh, its uh, line all the way to Waco. Because you see um, things like this pass, 1893, uh, where it talks about the Waco route. Of course, that was never built. But I guess they had designs on extending to Waco at one point. Anything you notice about this uh, railroad pass? Is that the deal he was Dallas more than Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it, yeah, George, George B. Dealey, yeah, he was the uh, owner, editor of the Dallas News. And of course, again, you see uh, signature down there. 
EHR Green. And that's what Dealey Plaza is named after his yep. name? Yep, Dealey Plaza, yep. This is a cover from a book uh, that came out a few years ago. And interestingly enough, uh, it mentions in here that the Texas prison gangs were actually used uh, by the Texas Midland for their uh, building some of their uh, extensions. So they did use uh, prison labor. They weren't the only railroad that did, but they was one of them. Okay, list of stations. We'll start with Ennis, and we're going to work north. Uh, Ennis uh, is known as milepost zero, okay, after, after it replaced Garrett as the start of the railroad. And here's some of the stations. Um, some of the names you might have make an educated guess as to uh, how the location got its name. Others are, are probably lost in memory. Um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, there's a difference between a station and a depot. It's a, it's a technical difference. A station is any place along a railroad where a train might stop. Okay, it might have a depot, which is a structure, but sometimes the only thing at a station is just a name sign, okay, or cattle pen, or you know some other water tower, possibly a water tower. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. So uh, not every one of these stations had a physical depot for passengers or freight. Okay. Or a loading dock. A loading dock is another structure that might be at a station. Uh, notice Rosser there at the, down in the uh, lower right-hand corner. If you go to Rosser today, there's an actual Texas Midland Depot there. How it escaped it, you know, demolition over the years. I'll never know, but it's interesting to drive down there. And they also have a water tower. Now, I think the water tower was reconstructed, but uh, it's, worth a, it's worth a drive sometime. If you're looking for an excuse for a, for a road trip. All right, part two is continuing on north. Of course, the next big town really after uh, Ennis would be Coffin. And then Terrell, which was the headquarters of the railroad. Even the state hospital in Terrell had, a, had its own station at one time. Probably for you know delivery of supplies, you know, for the hospital. Hattie, of course, I guess there's no uh, no uh, doubt about where that name came from. And then of course Roberts, which was originally the terminus of the railroad for a number of years. All right, moving on. Of course, we know we know from the map I showed earlier that Roberts was just just south of Quinlan. So uh, in Harlow, of course, Harlow Maybell. I'm sure that's where that name came from. And Greenville, mile post 72, and then Commerce. Uh, Commerce still has its uh, Texas Midland Freight Depot. We go up there today. There's a, a brick structure which is is a freight depot. Passenger depot is gone. Freight depot exists. And then uh, Cooper, uh, or somebody said, had another way to say that. Cooper, uh, different pronunciation. Anyway, Cooper has its uh, Texas Midland Depot. It's the Delta County uh, Historical Museum. Yeah. So if you're, you need another excuse for a road trip, drive up to Cooper. And then on up uh, to Paris. Milepost 124. All right, here's an example of, of one of the uh, more modern steam locomotives that uh, Ned Green purchased once he took over the railroad. This is what is known as a builder's card. Uh, the manufacturer would, would uh, take a photo of a who was built locomotive and used it in advertising and so forth. So um, this is uh, 
uh, a builder's card of locomotive number 150. Now, just for, for you, for those of you who are not familiar with how locomo steam locomotives are designated, you've got where no, there's four pilot wheels, leading wheels. You've got you know, two on one side, two on the other, so that's a total of four. And then you have one, two, three, plus three more on the other side, six driving wheels. And then back here behind the driving wheels, there are no uh, training wheels. Okay. So this would be known as a 460 type locomotive or a 10 wheeler, because of a total of 10, 10 wheels. All right, so very briefly, I'm going to kind of enumerate or list here the locomotives that Texas Midland either inherited or bought new. So we had a, an early locomotive number four, a 244 T, means a tank. In other words, it has a, the water and, and a coal kind of built into the locomotive as opposed to a separate tender. Okay, so they must have inherited that. Uh, 440, numbers 98, 99. That uh, photo I showed you, I think on the second slide, was number 99. So that was, uh, <coughs> that was a 440. That was also known as an American type locomotive, that configuration. Um, then they uh, also had uh, another series of uh, 440s um, that they acquired from Texas Central. Turns out that one of those actually had a name as opposed to a number, Jim Jones. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, and number 109 was uh, built after, um, or came to the railroad after Hedy, or Ned Green took over. Uh, it also had a name, Dick Farmer. Okay. It was a custom back in the 1800s, often the custom, that locomotives had names as well as numbers. And then as Railroads grew in size, it became a little bit cumbersome to name them all, so it just, that, that uh, kind of tradition kind of fell away. But at least in, at this time, they were still naming locomotives, or at least some of the locomotives. And I, I note here, this locomotive called Dick Farmer was patterned after uh, New York Central and Hudson River number 999. And that was a famous locomotive that broke its speed record uh, back in the late 1890s. Oddly enough, the engineer on that locomotive was a gentleman by the name of Hogan. No relation, but I'd like to take the for it. Uh, or claim kin to him. Uh, by the way, that locomotive, if you're curious, if you're up in Chicago, go up to the Museum of Tech Science and Technology, and the number 999 is preserved there in, in excellent condition. It'll give you an idea of what, what uh, Number 109 looked like. How fast did it go? Uh, over 100 miles an hour. Yeah. 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 I forget the exact, it was over 100. 112. 112? Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll get some more, um, more modern locomotives after uh, uh, Chrome Green took over the railroad. He had four 60s, those were called 10 wheelers. Um, in uh, one series there, 110 to 116. Another batch of 460s, 1897. And then uh, two AOs or more uh, freight engine type locomotives. Okay, so that was number 200, 201. Interesting enough, number 200, ex Texas Midland Railroad locomotive exists today down in Baytown, Texas. So if you want to see a existing Texas Midland lo steam locomotive, Take another road trip down to, to Baytown. Turns out that you know some of these locomotives were inherited by the Southern Pacific. A lot of them got scrapped. Some of them were still used by the Southern Pacific. And this one locomotive here just happened to survive and be donated. All right, here's Jim Jones. Right here under the cab window is, is the name Jim Jones. And, and of course, uh, instead of saying Texas Midland, it just says Midland Route. So you can see one of the two 
uh, descriptions on the tender, either Midland, Texas, Midland Route or Texas Middle. Some speculation as to why it's called Jim Jones. This I get from one of the docents or directors of the Terrell Heritage Museum. He claims, and he hasn't really you know, verified this, that Jim Jones was a Union Navy vet who settled in Able Springs, Texas, you know where Able Springs is, and um, worked for the railroad. Somehow or another, he managed to get the distinction of having a locomotive named after. I don't know if he saved a, saved a child or, you know, or saved the railroad money or what, what uh, he did to uh, warrant having a locomotive that named after. Dick Farmer, that, that was the other named locomotive that I mentioned earlier, found out that he was an engineer. So he also must have done something to uh, warrant uh, having a locomotive named after. The rest of the locomotives just sent numbers. This, is probably, this, this shot was probably taken at the Terrell shops, by the way. All right, so there's some schedules here. Okay. So the Texas Central was kind of an offshoot of the Houston Texas Central. Uh, here is the, the schedule for the Northwestern Branch from uh, Ross, which is near Waco, all the way out to Albany. And then here's the one of interest here. Garrett out to Roberts. And it just shows one big string a day in 1889. 1891, still known as the Texas Central. Not yet the Texas Midland. Here's the, here's the uh, well, at that, at that point they called the Northwestern Extension the, the main line and then the Northeastern Extension of Division. Again, from Garrett to Roberts. And again, just one mixed train in each direction a day. All right, 1896. Now, now we're in, under the uh, Texas Midland name and the uh, Ned Green uh, management. A little bit more activity here. Of course, the Paris to Terrell, this, this section of the uh, schedule, three trains a day, two passenger, one mixed. And for those of you who are not familiar, a mixed train is a train that has both passenger and freight cars. Okay. Over here, Terrell to um, Ennis. Again, the same, same three trains, two passenger, one mixed train. And of course, it, at Ennis, they connected with the Houston and Texas Central. Houston and Texas Central. So you could go on down to uh, Houston and Galveston. Ah, quite colorful. This is a uh, brochure published by the Texas Midland, kind of at that apex of its glory. Okay. Uh, they ran a crack train called the Lone Star Special. It connected with the uh, Houston and Texas Central at Ennis to take you on down to Houston and Galveston. At Paris, it would connect you with the Frisco Railroad to take you up to uh, uh, Arkansas and Missouri and on to St. Louis. And notice over here, one of the uh, promotions or places to, uh, to visit is the uh, Crescent Hotel in, in um, Eureka Springs, uh, Arkansas. That hotel's still there today. If you need another idea for a road trip, it's well worth, it's well worth seeing. And you can even stay there. Uh, I found out that my uh, paternal grandparents I spent their honeymoon in the, uh, at the Crescent, or at least in Eureka Springs. So they could have very well have taken the Texas Middle. All right, uh, Trey Journal here had an article in 1901 talking about the modernized uh, passenger cars that were uh, rebuilt and modernized. 
Oddly enough, the uh, paint scheme was, yes, green. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the, uh, the complete train set included a baggage course, mail and express, chair car, uh, a day coach. Chair car was a little bit more comfortable uh, accommodation than a, than a uh, coach. Okay. Uh, probably had reclining seats, whereas a coach probably just had stiff uh, uh, wooden bench type seats. And a cafe car. And of course, the lighting, interior lighting was done by acetylene gas. All right, 1903, another schedule here. Let's see if uh, a little bit out of focus here, but it mentions the Lone Star special here. And then uh, and then one other passenger train that uh, strictly went from Paris to uh, Ennis. At some point in the early 1900s, the, the name of that crack train Change from Lone Star, Lone Star Special to Lone Star Limited. Here's a, another handout brochure uh, showing the. Uh, this is the. Uh, this is the. Uh, looks like the interior of that Pullman observation. It had a lounge area, uh, and it. There would be a, a vestibule out here. You, know, you can walk out and see the scenery and so forth. Enjoy the fresh air. And then back, back the other way would be uh, yes. bedrooms and so forth for, for the sleeping car passengers. Yes, is that the kind of car that's down at the Charles City Park? No. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> There's a story behind that. All okay. Right. All right. All right. We'll come back. <laughs> there, there are people that wish it was, but oh, it's not. Okay. All right. A little bit more about the Lone Star Special. Tells you here some of the connections. Uh, St. Louis San, and San Francisco and Frisco. Go on up to Paris and uh, from Paris to St. Louis. Uh, Midland would take you Paris to Ennis. Uh, Houston and Texas Central would go from Ennis to Houston. And then uh, Santa Fe would take you from Houston to Galveston. And they had uh, the accommodations at reclining chair uh, cars and reclining, yeah, same thing. Okay, as well as uh, a Pullman observation scoop. And here's the schedule over here. Basically, you know, for, for long distance, the uh, Texas Midland was kind of, no pun intended, the middleman uh, between coming down from St. Louis and going all the way to Houston and Galveston. All right, 1912, another innovation was introduced to the Texas Fiddler. Uh, you know, steam trains are expensive to operate, and they're time consuming in terms of maintenance and so forth. Uh, they, um, Ned Green uh, purchased two of these, these are known as uh, motor cars, or self-propelled gasoline electric cars. Okay. and introduce those on the railroad to take, to take the place of some of the steam operating trains. And these were built by General Electric. And here's a, an article in one of the uh, trade journals of the time, 1913. Uh, basically extolling the advantages of having motor cars as, a, as opposed to a conventional steam train. This Mr. F.B. McKay, he was one of the uh, uh, managers of the uh, Texas Midland. So he's being uh, quoted here in praise of the uh, motor cars. One good thing about Ned Green, or another good thing about Ned Green, is he hired competent managers to, to take up to 
operate his rotor. So even when he was away, uh, they could run things pretty much to his satisfaction. This is a little um, schedule that was put out after the motor cars were introduced. All right, so once the motor cars were introduced, then you had uh, well, you had four trains a day. Two of the four were motor cars. Okay. And then uh, south of Terrell, the conventional passenger trains continued on to Ennis. Okay. Now here, this is interesting here. Well, what happened to these two motor cars that that uh, terminated in Terrell? Well, they didn't terminate in Terrell. They operated over the Texas and Pacific into Dallas. So you could go to, from Paris all down to Terrell over to Dallas on uh, a motor car without changing you know, equipment. A few years later, uh, again, they seem to be using the motor cars more, more often. Uh, although there's not two trips here, there's just one trip a day. Again, again Paris to Terrell, and then over the Texas <coughs> Pacific from Terrell to Dallas. And then um, I guess they, they use the other motor car over here to replace the, the steam operated train down to Ennis. So it looks like the uh, motor cars were taken over. The, um, the motor cars didn't pull cars behind them, did they? They or could, they? but it, I, don't, I have uh, no evidence that the Texas Midland used it. Okay. But in, on other railroads, they would have a trading coach behind the motor car, just depending on the terrain and, and how powerful the motor car was. All right, uh, Texas Midland uh, like to name their cars as opposed to just giving them a number. So here are the names of uh, the uh, regular passenger cars on the Texas Midland. Two of which named after uh, places, Cooper and Terrell. Those are cafe cars. Uh, the rest of them, oh, those are Greenville down there. Okay. You might search the neighborhood and see if some farmer got that put it on his farm as a, as a, you know, for storage or something. Um, some of them have kind of exotic names. Uh, this, I had to do some research on this. That happens to be the name of a river in Massachusetts, where, of course, uh, he grew up. And then you have uh, some names down here from the, Mythology in the uh, classical world. Yeah. Fortunately, we have a picture of these, one of those cars, the, uh, the Cooper. Uh, I guess he took it off of home rails uh, down, down along the Gulf Coast one time. And uh, here's a photo of it. You have to wonder if that might have been a trip down to, to uh, in the vicinity of his uh, tarpon club, tarpon <coughs> hotel. This may be a dumb question, but what, what exactly is a cafe car? Is that for dining? It's, it's a, di a dining car. Yeah, a dining car, yeah. You know, it might have a limited menu and so forth, but it provided some meal service. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a, a picture of Ned Green's private car or business car. Uh, over the course of time, it had many names, or number, I-99, Maybell, Lone Star, 
There's another name that pops up, and you have to wonder if it was a, the same car or maybe another business car. It was also a Paris, um, a, a, a private car named Paris. So uh, don't know if this if that was the fourth name for the same car or whether he actually had uh, two two business cars. All right, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know Ned Green went only the best for his railroad. So here are some of the uh, innovations that he undertook as, uh, as president of the railroad. Of course, his number one money-making uh, uh, or number one source of revenue was cotton. Right. And at the time, unfortunately, uh, old weevil infestation had made its way up from Mexico, and so that was on the minds of every cotton farmer in the state of Texas. So, uh, being the benevolent person he was, he uh, he sponsored a experimental farm just south of Terrell. I'm told roughly about where the airport is in Terrell. That he uh, <coughs> had an experimental farm uh, constructed to try to uh, and bring in some experts to try to control uh, the bull weevil infestation. I'm also told that after the I don't know if, if they actually got it under control or not, but uh, eventually that got turned into a, a, a floral farm. They grew uh, flowers for, uh, you know, for decorative purposes. So, uh, 1900, he ordered steel boxcars. This is in a time when most boxcars were made of wood, still. Electric headlights and locomotives, that was an innovation. Uh, the cafe lounge car and Pullman sleepers that were mentioned earlier on the Lone Star Special. Those were um, those were perks. Okay. Faster steam locomotives. Now, when I say faster, uh, uh, they probably never went over 35, 40 miles an hour. I mean, they, the locomotive on good track, like in New York State, maybe on the New York Central and Hudson River, can probably go over 100. But the track down here, uh, you know. You know, 35, uh, 40, maybe 45 miles an hour was probably a fast speed. And then uh, he also used uh, what's called burnt gumbo as ballast. That's uh, the under material on which you put the ties and so forth. You know, many railroads back then simply laid ties down on bare ground and laid rail on top of that, and that was that. So you were really improving things if you uh, had some kind of a material, either rocks or burnt gumbo ballast, to uh, stabilize that road bed. What pre tell is burnt gumbo? <laughs> burnt gumbo. Not to be confused with Louisiana gumbo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a mixture of clay and the black, you know, soil, you know, that black time soil that you find around here. And it's heated, somehow heated, and it produces a very stable uh, material. Uh, if, if you're ever interested in reading up on this, maybe I should have done that. Uh, if you go, if you Google Josephine, Texas, okay, which is not too far from here, is it? Mm -hmm. All right. They had a series of pits just north of the town where they made this burnt gumbo. Mm -hmm. They did it for the Cotton Belt Railroad. I don't know if Texas Midland got their burnt gumbo from there or had their own sources. But if you're interested in learning about burnt gumbo, look up Josephine, Texas, burnt gumbo, you know, Google that, and uh, it might provide you some more information. So. In fact, if you, if you look at topographical <coughs> today, you'll see some, uh, of Josephine, you'll see some, like, lakes and lagoons north of town, which is where that, that material was uh, dug up and processed. All right, a little bit about infrastructure, okay? So we said earlier that not all stations are dep have depots, but all depots are at stations. So I'm starting in Paris. This is the uh, Union Depot up there, still there today. Um, uh, Lamar County, I think the Geological Society has part of that building. 
Uh, I think the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce still has that bit, part of that building. Behind it, about a block, is the uh, Lamar County Historical Museum. Um, and oddly enough, for a few short years, the Texas Midland had their own depot about where that museum is today. Okay, but at some point, they, they moved over along with the Santa Fe and the Frisco to the Union Station. Commerce had a very almost mansion-looking depot at one time. The Midland goes, uh, veers off to the left, and then the, the train you see here is a cotton belt train. Now, that was replaced at some point by a much, or I should say a less elegant looking depot, which I think burned, I don't know, sometime in the 80s or 90s. Greenville, of course, this is a, a common postcard you might find if you're looking for a railroad uh, theme for Greenville. That's a Texas Midland train, of course. I'm guessing, well, I'm not sure if that's, if that's headed north or south. I really don't know. But this is the same depot in green. Interestingly enough, there is, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but the, the public library here has a collection of photos from the turn of the century, 1890s, early 1900s. It's called the Eddie Daniels Collection. I don't know if that's the name of the photographer or the person who donated the, the, the pictures. But anyway, I'll show you the website in a minute. You can, you can check it out. But that's the uh, original, or, or at least one of the early uh, Union stations here in Greenville, Texas. Served cotton belt trains and Texas middle trains. Katie had its own depot, other side of town. Now, at some point, this depot got rebuilt, and they retained some of the features, like that arch entryway, but the tower went, this uh, taller structure on the uh, right-hand side went, and it was a little bit uh, uh, somewhat modified depot that lasted until early 1970s. This is the best picture on the Texas Midland that I found. Again, from that Eddie Daniels collection, Greenville Public Library. Sharp looking train. Picture as clear as, as it can be, sharp. Okay. And you can see a hint of the Greenville Depot off in the far left. Just a little bit of that tower. Is that the same depot that's over on Lee Street? No, it's not. That's the case. Yeah. This one was on the east side of town. This would be on this side of town. Yeah. Sharp looking train. There's some other um, railroad photos in that same collection, of which I'm not sure are Cotton Belt or uh, Texas Middle. But this, this one for sure is Texas Middle. <coughs> you, can, you can read it on the tender, and you also the locomotive number matches up with one of the ones I showed you earlier in the list. Okay, very sharp. And by the way, the, the uh, collection. Also has photos, not just of railroads. I mean, there's just you know general life scenes, buildings. Uh, it's really worth checking out if you, you know if you live in or around here. Terrell that also had a fine looking depot, kind of a witch's hat tower there. All right. The This is the middle right here. And then from right to left would be the Texas and Pacific. Okay. And this depot lasted uh, up until early 60s sometime, maybe around 63. Unfortunately, it got torn down. It would have been a nice, uh, nice edifice to have a preserve. And just south of the depot, there was uh, the Texas Midland shops, okay, car shops, locomotive sh shops, with the 
keen eye, maybe if you got real close, you could see the kind of witch's hat tower of the Terrell Union Station. Okay. So this, this place is this photo sometime after 1897, 1899. Uh, now, Texas Midland at one time had their own two story depot that was back toward the shops, mm -hmm. and then it got replaced with the Union Depot that I showed you in the previous slide. I went to this location probably 30 years ago, and there was, you know, try to find where it was, and there was a big uh, junk heap uh, south of town, which I'm pretty sure was the was the uh, site of the shops. Um, once Southern Pacific took over the Texas Midland, they basically tore these down. Probably moved everything to Ennis. Ennis, of course, was the uh, southern terminus of the Texas Midland. They, uh, they actually had their own depot, depot for a while, uh, about two streets over from this one here, which is the Houston and Texas Central or Southern Pacific Depot. Okay. It was a, since it was a division headquarters, they had a very large uh, depot there for offices and so forth. This burned, I think, sometime in about 1935, and so this structure, which is still there, and which is their cultural and railroad heritage museum, was at one time the uh, Van Noy restaurant. Van Noy was kind of a uh, food vendor, kind of like Fred Harvey was. Maybe not as good. Okay. So they moved the, the uh, passenger depot operations to this structure until the end of the uh, passenger service, which was 1958. So you would have seen Texas Midland trains come, come and stop here. All right. Now we're talking about the demise of the Texas Midland. So um, about the time he Hetty Green started to decline in health, uh, Ned spent more and more time up north uh, visiting her and care taking care of her. She died in 1916. And so uh, after about that time, uh, he would come to Texas maybe two or three times a year. In his, in his private car. Okay. Basically left operations to, to his managers. Okay, now around 1928, uh, it, the railroad was purchased by the Southern Pacific, or the Texas and New Orleans, as they called the uh, uh, railroad in the state of Texas and Louisiana. And then it was, uh, it was abandoned in pieces. First in 1942, there was a big flood of the Trinity, wiped out the bridge, and so rather than rebuild it, Southern Pacific said, we're just going to abandon it. You know, in us, caught. Okay. Now, in 1942, they still maintained, uh, you know, uh, passenger service. They, had, they also had a motor car, and that's what they used on the, uh, uh, that's what Southern Pacific used on the uh, rest of the line. Then from uh, 1958, they abandoned Kaufman to Greenville. Not exactly sure what the reason for that abandonment was. I don't know if it was lack of business or, or what, but that's um, so. Uh, Terrell, which was once its headquarters, was now no longer on the original Texas Middle. And then sometime in the early 1970s, there were washouts up, uh, I think, mainly north of Commerce up in Paris that wiped out a lot of the rail. And again, they said, that's it. We're just going to abandon the whole thing. And so they did. There are some very small sections of the Texas Middle that, that still exist today. Up around Commerce, where I mentioned that they have a freight depot, there's a little bit of track there that's Texas Middle. And then if you go um, in Terrell, Union Pacific has a, a, a spur that goes down by the airport. That was also at least on the same right of way as the Texas Middle. So those are the only two bits of uh, Texas Midland track that are still in existence that I'm aware of. Okay, so uh, where do I get all this stuff? Uh, some of it's from 
photos and stuff like those brochures that I collected. Terrell Public Library also has uh, a limited number of photos of the, uh, from the Texas Midland, or of the Texas Midland. The Terrell Heritage Museum, also same thing. Um, they uh, also produce a replica of a uh, Kaufman County brochure that was published to promote the county back then. And it has uh, uh, some Texas Midland photos. Oddly enough, instead of showing the depot in Terrell, they show the depot in Greenville, which, which is, of course, not in Kaufman County. All right. And then last but not least, the Greenville Public Library uh, has these photos that I mentioned, these really sharp, clear photos from, you know, around the 20th, uh, turn of the century, 19th to 20th century. Uh, and it's at this website here. It's well worth uh, paying a visit to that. Not only for the railroad material, but just the daily life. Uh, images that uh, the photographer, whoever it was, took. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? If I'm not mistaken, World War II, they ran a spur out to Bakersfield off of Oh, okay. That, okay. And that's where the fairgrounds is now. Okay. That's where they had a spur. Out. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any idea what the cost to ride the train was? Uh, I can just give. I can give you a general estimate, just pennies per mile. Back, you know, back in the, probably 1900. Yeah, it might cost you, I don't know, uh, 25 cents to go from Greenville to Terrell. I just, that was just a wonder. Right? Yeah, I, I, uh, I can research that for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, send me a note when I get back to Minnesota. And let me oh, sure. <laughs> I, can, I, I can send you a note anywhere. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking, but I just wondered back in those that time of, uh, of what costs were. Yeah, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know, it generally was like pennies per mile, you know, two or three cents a mile. Yeah. That not part of the uh, train schedule then? The sometimes they quote uh, fares, sometimes they don't. Okay, and, and the ones I had here, I didn't, I didn't have any fares uh, attached to them. To the material, so I could probably find find it if I dig hard enough. I like digging stuff. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. I've been told I have verified that the last trip Texas Midland made from Greenville to Kaufman, it crosses Highway 34 back to side of Cash, and a gentleman that lived in that area with no signals, just signs. So right. It ran over him and killed him. Bob Green. Bob Green. Okay, yeah, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, so very, very unfortunate. Yeah, this railroad would have had no signals whatsoever. It was not, not that sophisticated railroad to, 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 to warrant signals. Do you have a question? Oh, I think. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank talking about his night sky photography, which is a temporary exhibit we will also be having um, out on display all the time for the eclipse that's coming through. And um, we have Easter After Dark is coming up on March 22nd. And then on April 6th, we, we are doing a space day for uh, activities and events for the kids and families out here as part of the whole week of that eclipse activities. So enjoy and have a great uh, rest of your day. <laughs>